We look to doctors to be the ones to have our best interest at heart when we're unwell, injured, or undergoing surgery. But not all doctors have the best of intentions when it comes to their patients, opting instead to exploit their vulnerabilities to fit their own twisted needs. Number 5. Michael Swango was born in 1954 in Tacoma, Washington, before moving to Quincy, Illinois, where he spent the rest of his childhood. He would graduate as valedictorian of his high school class and would go on to serve in the Marine Corps, receiving an honorable discharge in 1976 at age 22. While studying at the Southern Illinois University School of Medicine, he started exhibiting disturbing behavior, preferring to work as an ambulance attendant instead of focusing on his studies. He showed an intense interest in dying patients, and many of the patients assigned to him would end up coding or having near-death emergencies with at least five of them passing away. Upon graduating from SIU, he received a less than admirable evaluation letter from the dean but he managed to gain a surgical internship from Ohio State University Medical Center. During his time there, nurses started to notice that relatively healthy patients started to pass away at an alarming rate, and he was caught injecting an unknown medicine into one patient who became ill shortly after. When the nurses reported this to administration, they were ignored as being paranoid, and after a brief investigation, he was cleared of any wrongdoing. When his internship ended, however, OSU rescinded the residency offer due to his work being subpar. In 1984, he started work as an emergency medical technician, despite having been fired from a Springfield ambulance service after he made a heart patient drive to the hospital. His fellow paramedics started to notice that they would become violently ill whenever Swingo brought any food in or prepared the coffee, and he was arrested later that year after arsenic and various other poisons were found in his possession. He was sentenced to five years in prison for poisoning his co-workers. This would force him to change his name to Daniel Adams and to forge medical documents in order to find work at the Stony Brook University School of Medicine in New York, where he worked in the psychiatric residency program. Here, his patients would once again inexplicably pass away, and after being questioned, he was fired. Authorities began an investigation, and Swingo fled to Atlanta, where he worked as a chemist. The FBI alerted the company, who quickly dismissed him, but by the time the FBI had obtained a warrant for his arrest, he'd fled to Zimbabwe, where, just as before, his patients died without explanation. He would eventually flee to two other countries, but would later be arrested while traveling to Saudi Arabia, and he was sentenced to three consecutive life terms without parole. Number 4 Born in France in 1897, Marcel Petio was a troubled child. When he was just 11 years old, he fired his father's pistol while in class, and as a teenager, he robbed a post box, resulting in his arrest. After being sent for evaluation, it was found that he had a mental illness, and the charges against him were dropped. He would eventually be expelled from school, forcing him to finish his education at a special academy in Paris. In 1916, he volunteered for the French army during World War I. But during a battle, he was wounded and gassed, causing him to have a breakdown. While spending time in a psychiatric hospital, he was diagnosed with further mental illness, but he returned to war in 1918. He would ultimately be discharged after yet another diagnosis of mental issues. When the war ended, he gained his medical license in just three months due to an accelerated education program and he started to work at a mental hospital. Here, he became addicted to narcotics and gained a reputation for dubious medical practices and petty theft. 
In 1926, Louise de Laveau, a woman he'd been having an affair with, disappeared and witnesses described seeing Petio load a trunk into his car. Police would later declare her as a runaway. That same year, he became the mayor of Villeneuve sur Yvonne, but would later be suspended in 1931 after his fraudulent financial dealings and thefts came to light. During the German occupation of France in 1940, he used the codename Dr. Eugene and claimed to be able to get people who were wanted by the Germans out of France undetected. His accomplices would direct Jewish people, criminals, and resistance fighters to him, where he would claim that they needed to be inoculated. He would then inject them with cyanide, rob them of their possessions, and dump their bodies in a river. When the Gestapo found out about his escape route, his accomplices were arrested and admitted under torture that Dr. Eugene was in fact Marcel. He was arrested but released a few months later. In 1944, Petio's neighbors complained to police about a foul odor in the area and huge amounts of smoke coming from his house's chimney. Firemen were summoned and they entered his house to find a fire in a coal stove in his basement. Inside the stove and scattered around it were human remains that he'd been incinerating. More remains were found in a quicklime pit and canvas bag in his garden. However, he had already fled the scene, telling his friends that Gestapo was pursuing him. He was eventually arrested in Paris on the 25th of May, 1946, and he was beheaded. Number 3 Thomas Cream was born in 1850 in Glasgow, Scotland, but grew up just outside of Quebec City, Canada. He gained a medical degree in 1876 and would end up practicing in Ontario. He also married in 1876, and his wife would pass away from consumption the next year. In 1879, a woman who he was seeing named Kate Gardner was found deceased in an alleyway behind his office and it was found that she'd been poisoned with chloroform. After he was accused of taking her life, he fled to Chicago, where he set up a medical practice near the red light district. During this time, two women under his care died inconspicuously. The first was a surgical patient, the second merely received treatment from him, and after her death, he tried to blackmail the pharmacist who had filled out her prescriptions. In 1881, another patient, Daniel Stott, died from poisoning after Cream gave him a remedy to help with his epilepsy, and Cream would once again blame the pharmacist after attempting to blackmail him. This time, however, Cream and a woman named Julia Stott were arrested. She stated that she had procured poison in order for Cream to end her husband's life. He was sentenced to life in prison but was released in 1891 and he soon moved to London. On the 13th of October that year, 19-year-old street worker Ellen Donworth accepted a drink from him and died three days later from poisoning. Cream wrote to the coroner offering to reveal the name of her murderer for $300,000. He would also accuse W.F. Smith, the owner of W.H. Smith bookstalls, of the murder. On the 20th of October, he met with another street worker, Matilda Clover, who died the next morning and he wrote to Dr. William Broadbent, accusing him of the murder and demanding money from him. Broadbent would, however, send a letter to the Scotland Yard. On the 11th of April, 1892, he met with two more street workers and, while in their flat, gave them each a bottle of Guinness laced with poison, killing both women. Due to the accusatory letters he'd sent, Cream was put under surveillance and police learned of his previous murder conviction. He was arrested and on the 15th of November, he was executed by hanging. His last words were reported to be, quote, I am Jack V and then he passed away. Number 2 In 1997, Maxim Petrov lived in St. Petersburg, Russia. He was working as an emergency doctor and preferred to visit with his patients in the morning when their relatives were at work. 
he would convince them that they needed an injection for high blood pressure, but instead would give them anesthesia and while they were unconscious, he would rob them. On the 2nd of February, 1999, while in the process of robbing one of his patients, he was interrupted by her daughter who caught him red-handed. He stabbed her with a screwdriver and strangled his patient, ending both of their lives. From that day on, he did away with the anesthesia, opting instead to inject his victims with a lethal concoction of drugs before burning down their homes. When police found that the victims were all selected from a list of lung patients who had undergone healthcare at a local healthcare center, they identified 72 possible future victims. In 2000, when Petrov visited one of these patients, he was arrested and immediately confessed. But he would recant his confession soon after, stating that he was under intense psychological pressure while he was in custody. Items belonging to some of the victims were found in his flat, and others had already been sold at the market. He was tried for 17 murders, found guilty of 11, and sentenced to life in prison. Number 1 Hugh Won Lin, a self-proclaimed omnipotent doctor, believes that water causes disease and he developed a treatment that he would administer to his patients in China. His treatments involved the preparation of herbal remedies containing high doses of sodium sulfate, which can be lethal. He also engaged in the traditional practice of Qi Gong, where he would claim to emit Qi from his body which acts as a healing force without the need for physical contact. After a businessman under his care died due to dehydration, it was found that he'd been practicing medicine without a license. He was arrested and sentenced to life in prison. While in jail, he started a medical practice, but after 13 of his patients passed away, he was no longer allowed to continue. In 1997, he had a retrial and was acquitted, after which he continued to practice medicine illegally, opening hospitals in a nearby province. He would eventually be banned from practicing medicine by local authorities in 1998, prompting him to move. He became well known across China as a miracle doctor, even having his medical practice and miracles detailed by a Chinese novelist and he managed to continue practicing for years by bribing corrupt officials. He was arrested and jailed again in 1993 after three more of his patients died, one of which was the mayor of a nearby town. This time, he received a sentence of 15 years. His voting rights were suspended for five years, and he was ordered to pay a fine of $150,000. But once again, he was released early, and in 2013, he created a health retreat where he would treat 12 patients at a time. After a 22-year-old college student who was a believer in traditional Chinese medicine died under his care, the autopsy revealed that he had been severely dehydrated. Wan Lin refuted these claims stating that he regularly ingested up to 1.5 liters of the concoction himself without ever being negatively affected by it. He would finally be arrested again in 2014 and charged with practicing medicine without a license, receiving another sentence of 15 years in jail. One of his prodigies, Liu Wei, claimed that Wan Lin was a master of medicine and knew how to cure diabetes and AIDS, and he was also tried and sentenced to 11 years behind bars. It's estimated that Wan Lin is responsible for the deaths of up to 146 people. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video, be sure to click that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.